to the second, second lecture in the 35th year of the winter lecture series. Our title this time, as you probably know, The Korean Peninsula, Past, Present, and Future. I'm Dick Deanspear, a member of the organizing committee. Um, the, the actual sponsor of the winter lecture series is the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church. And we partner, as most of you who are here know, with OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning. You, you know that because um, you know that Thomas Berg, our lecturer tonight, is a OLLI star. And um, <laughs> many of you are here not as regulars of the Winter Lecture Series, but as regulars of OLLI, I suspect. Um, the program is funded in part by Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Last uh, time when I introduced things, I said, oh, there are five lectures in this series. Well, I don't know. I had been near someone who was smoking something, I think. <laughs> there are six lectures in this series. This is the second of six. Um, our third, as I mentioned to you last time, uh, is going to conflict with watching the Oscars. Eh. <laughs> you know, if you, if you record the Oscars, then you'll be able to go fast forward through all those parts you really don't want to watch anyway, and that's going to turn out to be most of it. So <laughs> co come, and, um, come and hear Professor and Ambassador Christopher Hill talking about his adventures as ambassador to South Korea and as the person who um, really led the team to uh, have the last of the um, denuclearization treaties with North Korea. One that fell apart very, very quickly after it was negotiated, but uh, perhaps um, he'll have some wisdom for us. And the interesting thing, of course, is that his February 24th talk is going to come just about two or three days before our uh, presidents, Kim and Trump, get together to supposedly finalize the agreement, uh, this modern agreement for denuclearization. So it, it'll be interesting. Um, the, the man formerly known as Rocket Man negotiating with the man formerly known as the Dotard, which, <laughs> which is a word none of us knew what, what meant you know, before it happened. Uh, all the lectures available on the Unitarian Lincoln uh, org website. So are announcements there of bad weather. G um, sometimes I tell people it's Lincoln Unitarian, but it's Unitarian Lincoln. The Unitarian bit comes first if you need to go to that website. You, um, I remind you if you are new, if you're new, I'm not reminding you, I'm telling you for the first time that there is parking available across Eldon Drive um, and you can park in the parking lot over there without any kind of problem. And the rhythm of tonight's activities will be the same as always. We'll have a lecture that will last as much as an hour depending upon when Thomas gets tired. Um, 15 minutes of a, a pause with refreshment in the other room and afterwards return here for question and answers. We will adjourn no later than nine o'clock, but uh, once in a while we adjourn earlier than that if people run out of questions. So um, if you leave a contribution at the, uh, the table that has the refreshments, the contribution does not fund the refreshments, but it funds future winter lecture series. So if you're feeling generous, uh, leave big bills there. Um, Please quiet cell phones. Today's lecturer, Thomas Berg, will be introduced by uh, John Comer. Well, good evening. I'm certainly glad I arrived early, or I, I might be sitting at the piano or someplace. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it uh, uh, certainly is a pleasure uh, for me to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, we didn't cross paths while I was at UNL, uh, but I have benefited from sitting in on several of his courses since I've been uh, retired. Professor Thomas B Borg, Berg was uh, born and spent his early years in Minnesota, 
where he acknowledges he developed in his interest in history along with a uh, fascination with all things military. He graduated from Union College here in Lincoln, earning a degree in computer science uh, and then history. Uh, he continued his education, uh, earning a master's and PhD in history at UNL with a concentration in uh, military history. He is currently a uh, lecturer of history at UNL and an adjunct professor of history at Union College. He teaches a number of courses, uh, uh, history courses, both on campus and online at UNL and at Union College. He's published across a variety of areas and over his 20 year uh, career since earning the PhD has won numerous uh, teaching honors uh, for classroom teaching and his interactions with students. Uh, quite the attraction, as Dick mentioned in Ali, he fills up the 200 plus seat Edgewood Theater Auditorium uh, every time he teaches. Uh, I do notice tonight that he's not wearing one of his trademark Hawaiian shirts or his Bermuda shorts, but uh, maybe we can pursue that uh, during the Q&A. Uh, but even if he's not wearing his Hawaiian shirt, uh, he's here this evening to share with us. Please welcome Professor Berg. Thank you. I, I don't know whether to say I'm sorry or thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, if anyone needs a hearing assist device, please see the gentleman way back in the corner in that direction. He will literally hook you up. Uh, I know that's a pun, and thank you for that, but uh, save it for later because I'm sure I'll need it then. Uh, 35 years of this program. Outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. I hope after tonight's uh, presentation, there'll be 36. <laughs> uh, so we'll see where it goes from, from here. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is to present a bit of how in the world we get to the situation where we have a Korean War, what the Korean War entailed uh, just on such the smallest of fighting. I will not be going through tactics or strategies, etc maybe some big arrows on the map type of look, and then what difference does it make that we fight the Korean War? What, what does it ultimately do for us? Not merely in the United States, certainly not only in Korea, but what does it do for the entirety of our globe and our world community? So let's take a look and see. A uh, couple of things to, to do. First, I'd like to just do a little bit of an overview uh, at the international level, and then maybe a look at, uh, at the Korean level, and then from the United States. And certainly, uh, some of the events might be a little bit more memorable to you than it, say, would be to my freshmen, or sophomores, or juniors, or seniors, or graduate students or most anybody else that I happen to know, but still, <laughs> maybe uh, if, if you happen to uh, remember a particular incident or an event, I would ask that you share that with me, uh, certainly by the Q&A, or as we all rush out for coffee and cookies, or you know, sometime, but I would certainly welcome what you do remember, because it's important to me, because it's a way that I get to pass along that oral history to my students, which I believe is a strong uh, part of history. So let's take a look. Uh, from the international community, I'm sure you remember that after World War II, when the Soviet Union had swept across the eastern portion of Europe, and now we find locked in the Soviet orbit nations like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Albania, Yugoslavia, Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, all of those nations locked in. And as an, uh, at an address in Missouri, former Prime Minister Winston Churchill came at the invitation of Fulton University and of course uh, President Harry Truman 
and in it he gave one of the most fundamental speeches that we've ever heard, where he declares that from uh, the Baltic down to the Balkans, an iron curtain has descended, separating Western and Eastern Europe. And with that, certainly, the, not just the mindset of us versus them, but now looking at how Western Europe must defend itself against a potential marauding Eastern Europe. Hitler is gone. Mussolini is gone. Italy and Germany are nations that basically didn't exist except at the mercy of the conquered or the conquering nations. And so, just as nature abhors a vacuum, so too does politics. And as the United States and Western allies, but predominantly the United States, fills in part of the power vacuum in Europe, so too does the Soviet Union, but now from the East. And so now we have this, what would become a titanic struggle lasting until, 18, or until the uh, 1980s, uh, in 1989, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism, et cetera, et cetera. So for the next 50 years plus, the European uh, political landscape is pretty much set. What else do we find? That in... I fade to nothing. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, Let's see. And, and never see me in hell or mood. Today's lecture will be brought to you by <laughs> UFOs and Elvis is in the building. Let's see if uh, putting the pack in a different pocket will work. Now that was not me. <laughs> but there will be a test on what you had seen, so <laughs> memory is important. All right, let's see if, if this works out better uh, uh, in the terms of, of audio. Of course, we have the Truman Doctrine that in March 1947, with the marauding communists into Greece and the marauding communists in Turkey, and of course the fear that the United States had about communism spreading throughout Europe, President Harry Truman issues a proclamation that basically says the United States will help other nations defend against communism wherever this occurs. Now, part of that was the United States is not going to send troops. The United States is not going to send advisors. The United States will send you money. We might send you material, but you are going to have to do it on your own. Okay. Well, that's... That's okay. Why? I mean, the United States did not want to get involved in another European war. I mean, it makes sense. You've just seen a couple hundred thousand American lives lost, much less the millions of Europeans' lives that had been gone. So Truman issues this as America's commitment to Europe. All right? Fine. We get to the Marshall Plan, crafted by Secretary of State George C. Marshall, who at one time was one of America's great military leaders, chief of staff of the United States Army, who had organized the material and troop movement of American personnel to both Europe and to Asia to defeat both Germany and Japan in conjunction with allies, of course. And so Marshall, in trying to figure out how we could help Europe avoid a political catastrophe as what had befallen Italy, as what had befallen Germany after World War I, when the economic system fell apart, no one in Italy and Germany trusted the elected government. And if you did not trust the elected government, then maybe you're willing to reach out towards any political opportunity, like fascism or Nazism. And so Marshall, along with other members in the United States, uh, in particularly in Truman's administration, crafted a multi-billion dollar plan, almost $13 billion, that would be lent 
to European nations where they could start to reconstruct their economic system because if dads can go to work and put food on the table, clothes on the kids' backs, and give a roof to his wife and children, then maybe dad has a stake, maybe the family has a stake in this new nation that is growing out of Germany, new nation that is growing in Italy. And also, France and England and all the other potential uh, nations that might experience economic, not just collapse and meltdown, but political collapse and meltdown. Because remember, every nation in the world lost in World War II in the economy. Everybody's economy tanked, except ours. American economy was stronger than ever before. Not just after World War I, but after World War II as well. Our economic system was strong. Our food production was grand. We had more food than we could, than we could consume. We could sell it easily to the Europeans who were getting credits from the American government through the Marshall Plan. And so here's what happens. It turns out to be a beautiful financial do si -do. The American government lends money to the Europeans. The Europeans lend money to their citizens. The citizens buy goods from the government, from the European governments who have purchased the materials from the United States. And then the American farmer, the American worker, puts that money back into the system, paying taxes. Make sure you pay yours soon. Mm -hmm. And so there it goes. The United States essentially funded the economic reclamation of Europe and by doing so establishes a political foundation that is oriented not towards crazy, weird political ideologies, fascism and communism and Nazism, but maybe they will give democracy yet another chance. Grand, great, that's wonderful. We also have uh, the, the collapse of Czechoslovakia in February 1948 when the Czechs who are yearning to be free now take a little bit, a step a little bit too far. They cross the line that their communist masters would not allow. And with the help of massive Soviet forces, the Czech government puts down the uprising. We also know that in uh, March 1948, Council of Foreign Ministers uh, from the Eastern Bloc get together and they are considering what to do. They see what the Americans under and the Europeans under the Marshall Plan are doing to bring up the economic stability, which lends to political stability, which lends to political support for Western democracy. The foreign ministers in Europe uh, from the Soviet Bloc do the same and they try to find a workable financial system that will prop up their governments, etc. So if nothing else, we're starting to see kind of a little bit of a head-to-head -head competition. And when we come out of a shooting war, where you can count who wins by how many enemy is dead, how much territory of his you have taken. In a cold war, it's easy to determine who wins and loses. Or I should say, in a hot war, it's easy to determine. In a cold war, you don't have those same metrics, so what can you do? You basically have the chalkboard up in the air, wins, losses. Hmm. So then, what else is taking place? The Berlin blockade, almost for an entire year. The United States and the British will be flying in hundreds of thousands, millions of tons of everything from coal, food, medical supplies, uh, milk cows, not just milk cows, but cows as well. Bring them into Berlin. Do everything to keep the Berliners alive because the Soviets had closed off all land accesses, all rail shut down, all roads shut down. Stalin was trying to starve out the people in Berlin to make sure that they could not uh, last long enough and the Americans and the French and the British would eventually throw their hands into the air with saddened disgust and say, oh, Marshal Stalin, you're a genius. We can't overcome you and what you've done. 
we gracefully bow out. Oh, no. He don't know how the Americans play this game. So what do we do? We organize, along with the British, a massive airlift of supplies. We built two airports in Berlin to absorb all the flights. At one time, at the height of the flight, there were 800 flights going in and out every, uh, let's see, every day. Massive. By far, um, more flights from the United States versus Britain, but at the cost of both American and British lives. It was a tragedy that we lose lives, but it was a chuck into the wind column that we get to use. Not only that, but we, in April 1949, create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that bridges the Atlantic Ocean, Canada, and the United States, reaching across the Atlantic Ocean, by which other Western European nations would bind together and say, this is our collective defense. If any nation ever attacks one of us, we all will consider it an attack upon us. There's only been one time in uh, NATO's history where we have activated that, and that was right after the 9-11 attacks, where we, the United States, asked for NATO's help because we were attacked, and NATO said yes. The system worked, and as far as I'm concerned, works pretty well. Anyhow, with this, in September 1949, well, actually, end of August, but by the time the United States got around to identifying it, it's about early September, we discover that the Soviets have detonated their first atomic bomb. And with that, of course, is now the fear of what the Soviets could do. We knew that the United States would never use nuclear weapons irresponsibly. We knew that we would never use them as some mechanism of counterbalance uh, uh, against a diplomatic situation where if some nation that doesn't have nuclear weapons, we would, we would never go to them, do what we want. Otherwise, there goes one of your big cities. We would never do that. But we could not trust the Soviets. <laughs> we could not trust them. And so when the Soviets detonate their first nuclear weapon, the American, the American had nuclear hegemony was now split. We were no longer in charge. So that's kind of the world situation S to keep in mind that the world was in a perilous uh, moment. What about North Korea? Well, we know that North Korea was divided at the end of World War II along the 38th parallel. And uh, as the American army has just barely put its toe onto the southernmost point of the Korean Peninsula, the Americans decided uh, where should the line of demarcation be between the Soviets that are going to be coming over the mainland, uh, from the mainland onto the peninsula, where should we stop? Much like American and Western forces stopped at the Elbe River in Germany at the end of World War II, we decided that the 38th parallel, far north of where the Americans were, far farther, much farther than where the American troops could press in such a short amount of time, the Soviets were going to be waiting there for a couple of weeks before the Americans could get up to the 38th parallel. But the Soviets said, fine. They were still in a rather easygoing mood at that moment. Uh, for as much as Joe Stalin could be in an easygoing mood. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the American and Soviet forces meet at the 38th parallel, and in the process, we find, of course, that the Soviets are wanting to ensure that the northern portion of Korea would always remain communist. Somewhere down the line, of course, the entire peninsula would hopefully turn communist. But how to get there? The Soviets selected this man, oop, Kim Il-sung, and he had, over the years, been an ardent communist, had been fighting against the Japanese during World War II, had been involved and brought many Koreans over to China in 1949 when Mao Zedong is pushing out Chiang Kai-shek onto the island of Formosa, and now the communist Chinese take over mainland China. K 
Jim had been there and led in, in brave fighting uh, troops. And so now, as he comes back to Korea, the communists, through the Soviet Union, wish to ensure that the communists have a strong leader, well-recognized, well-respected, Kim is the man. In North Korea, though, he starts his own cult of personality. This is where we start in the early days of having the great leader. And certainly by having men as models like Stalin and Mao, and you could look at Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler, who had created themselves a cult of personality, where now uh, Kim is seen as the man. There's only one person who can solve the issues. There's only one person who's smart enough to solve all the problems. There's only one man who has the vision, the fortitude, the intestinal fortitude to press through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, fine. So he sets himself up as the man, and as he amasses political and economic and military power, he is looking towards what to do on the Korean Peninsula. Is there a way that, that Kim could unite the Korean Peninsula under communist rule? Well, he consults with Stalin, and at one point in the uh, discussions, Stalin said, no, we had not, you'd not better press for war at this time. You'd never, uh, you will not make a success of it. Why? Well, certainly because uh, China had not yet been, this China issue had not yet been solved. Mao had yet to push off Chang from the mainland, and then also the United States had troops in Korea. And nobody knew really which way the United States would go. However, over the course of probably no more than six to eight months, there is a change of thinking with Stalin in consultation with Kim and in, as well, consultation with Mao, uh, that the war could, could be a success. But where to go? How to do this? How to ensure that it's going to work? Well, we happen to see, even at this time, between North Korea and South Korea, clashes along the border between ROK, Republic of Korea, South Korean troops, and the Democratic People Republic of China, North Korea, we see the, the scuffle between uh, the two armed camps, all right? With all that's going on, remember that in 49, Mao pushes off uh, Chang onto the island of Formosa, commonly called Taiwan, and of course the United States recognized still Chiang, uh, Chiang Kai-shek as the leader of the true China, not Mao, because obviously Mao is communist and we're into this Cold War now, and you certainly don't want to give a nod to the communists when there is a democratic alternative. We also have the issue of the Soviet's atomic bomb in 1949, which changes the balance of power, al at least along what we would call strategic weapons, uh, nuclear weapons. And then finally, uh, Kim believed that down in the South, when the North Koreans were to invade, that there would be South Koreans who would rise up and support, rise up and, and champion the cause of the North Koreans. And you might think, well, that seems rather illogical, until you remember that even back in the American Revolutionary War, when the British sent more and more troops to North America, they believed, incorrectly, that Americans loyal to the crown would rise up in the defense of King George III. Poor estimate back then, and even with Kim, in thinking about invading down to the south. So then, what about the United States? Keep in mind, if you will, that the United States is re-evaluating its foreign policy. It needs to understand, what do they do vis-a-vis -vis Europe? And when you get the Marshall Plan and NATO, the United States foreign policy starts to stabilize but in the immediacy after World War II, hey, just get the guys home, put them to work, we'll get everything done. Everything will be just ducky. Well, it takes a little bit of time, certainly on the domestic side, but still. Also in the United States, we, have, we are occupying Japan. 
And remember, the Japanese had occupied Korea and if, uh, with Parks, I'm sure you would, uh, Parks Koble last week, uh, he went through and discussed the, I, I think, part of the issue with the so-called comfort women from Korea and the atrocities that the Japanese uh, <coughs> visited upon the Korean people. But as the United States had occupied Japan, keep in mind that as the Japanese were a demonstrably docile people, the United States did not need <laughs> massive amounts of military power to keep law and order in that country. Which also meant we did not need to send over super uh, large tanks. Uh, the tanks, uh, American tanks would crush the bridges in Japan. Japanese bridges weren't designed to build that type of weight. So the United States had minimal forces in Japan. This is going to become a significant issue. Then we get the process of a, an American diplomat in Moscow who sends back a long message, hence the title, The Long Message. And it happens to be in uh, February 1946. And he, as a Sovietologist, probably our first person who is critically looking at the Soviet Union and from the inside as much as possible, he comes to the conclusion that communism will ultimately fail, but we need to outlast the communists. We need to outlast them. We can outlast them economically, we can outlast them culturally, but the Soviets, they're in for the long haul. We must be in for the longer haul. And in this long telegram, he gives to the American government and to Truman an idea of how to stop communism. And this is where we come to the issue of containment. We will contain communism. Now, there are different flavors. There are different styles of containment. We can contain the communists everywhere. Or we could create little bastions of defense here and there, scattered across the globe. We could use everything in our power. Or we could use this type of weapon, or this type of action, or this type of financial support. We could spend a lot of money doing it. Or we could be very smart and say we're going to spend money here to fix this issue, and maybe over there to address that issue, but we're not going to spend money everywhere like uh, watering your, your yard all at once. If a certain patch is dry, then water it rather than everything. The concept, though, of containment, regardless if it's going to be big or small, leads you to the mindset <sighs> that the communists are our enemies, led by the Soviet Union, and we need to figure out where the communists act and uh, what our reactions will be. Containment, very important, because it will be how we defend in Korea, how we defend under uh, nuclear policies, uh, the, uh, under the Eisenhower administration, under the Kennedy and Johnson administration, and even today. How do we contain our enemies? We also need to understand that the United States organizes its military under the National Defense Act in 1947. And even then, you know, this is now we get the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, because at one time the Army and the Navy were at the cabinet levels. But now they're all brothers. <laughs> well, you had now hopefully a parent look after them. But one of the big issues among the Army and the Marine, or not the Marines, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force was nuclear weapons. Because that was seen how the war ended against Japan. You drop a couple nuclear weapons, pop, pop, we're done. Not true. There are other massive issues beyond that, but still. <laughs> but nuclear weapons seem to be the sine qua non now of all American uh, military action in, in diplomacy. So the army needs to figure out how it's going to get a piece of the atomic pie. 
The Navy wants to figure out how you can put atomic bombs on airplanes and sending them off carriers, but the technology isn't there quite yet. The bombs are too big, the airplanes are too small, the carriers are too small. But you had the Air Force that had dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the Air Force. And now it's, of course, fighting for the almighty defense dollar. And you know what that's like when kids are trying to fight over allowances. Mom, Dad, you gave him a dollar more than me. What are you doing? I'm smarter. I'm prettier. <laughs> but still, the United States also has the issue of Truman and the Republicans. There is very little political agreement at this time. And then, of course, you get the development of thermonuclear weapons and the types of nuclear weapons that even at the very baby stage, even the very first ones, were somewhere around 300 times the size of Hiroshima. <laughs> Instead of a portion. In, in, if you were to have dropped the atomic bomb from Hiroshima onto New York City, and you aimed right at, uh, call it Central Park. You're going to blast apart Central Park, you're going to consume a lot of buildings around, and it would be devastation, et cetera, et cetera. You drop one of these new, even in the testing stage, thermonuclear weapons, you are going to blast buildings out to about a half mile outside of just the zone that will melt everything into a sea of glass. Thermonuclear weapons are unbelievably dangerous. But the crazy thing is, is that the technology allows you to grow them smaller so that you can put them on top of missiles that fit into submarines. And the even crazier thing about uh, these types of thermonuclear weapons, there is no theoretical limit to the explosive power. So when the Americans and the soon the Soviets are start pushing around uh, thermonuclear weapons, this whole thing called the Cold War really ramps up hard. Because now you're talking about ending the nation's existence. And that is a heavy weight. So uh, one of the most unintended speeches ever came from Secretary of State Dean Acheson in January 1950. And he's talking about America's uh, foreign policy, in particular throughout the Pacific. And in his particular speech, he talked on how the United States was there and Japan was important for the defense, Formosa, you know, uh, Taiwan, uh, China was important to American national security, and the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera. He did not say Korea. There are only a couple thousand American troops in Korea, at least in the southern half. And whether it was a slip of the tongue, a slip of the mind, or maybe it was, well, you know, we really don't need to talk about Korea because blah, blah, blah. But there were other people who were listening to that speech, Kim, Mao, Stalin, who hear that omission and that kind of allows Stalin an opportunity to say, more than likely, the Americans will not fight for Korea. What American is ultimately going to trade Chicago for Seoul? What American is going to trade Los Angeles for Busan? So, how will this work? We're wondering what's going to happen do the communists have a massive world plan to take over the world? The Americans are banking that the communists around the world are taking their marching orders from Joe Stalin. Stalin is coordinating everything. But you knew that the foremost defense had to be in Europe. Fight back against the Soviets. And, but whatever else happens around the world, more than likely a diversion. So the United States, if something pops up, we're not going to be just pulled aside. We find, though, that in 1950, just about two months, 
a little before, a little more than two months before the outbreak of the Korean War, the National Security Council puts out a paper, a memorandum, NSC 68. And this is what is going to give the United States its focal point on how to defend the world against communist aggression. They said, look, everything right now focuses on the Soviets and communism. This is a new world paradigm, and we just need to accept that fact. And so what we could do are, are four, four different options. We could do nothing, which is in itself an option. It may not be helpful, but doing nothing is indeed an option. We could, on the other hand, kind of go back to a fortress America, roll up the welcome mats, put a big, huge, I hate to say it, wall <laughs> around the United States. We could rely upon the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans to keep out anybody that we don't want. We could turn ourselves into a fortress mentality, a bunker mentality. Hunker down and that's it. We could, this is option number three, strike our enemies right now. Preemptive strikes, whomever they may be. Or we could end up rearming the United States, rearming our allies. Now, there are certain flaws in this process, and I, I, let's not get into them right at the moment, but at nothing else. The start of the Korean War was only in January, the end of, uh, sorry, June 1950, uh, just over two months. Now, Truman had taken this report. Truman had put it basically in the top left-hand drawer and shut it. But when the Korean War started, he pulls that out, he sends it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and says, what do you guys know about it? Oh, Mr. President, we've been looking at this, we've been studying it. And now, of course, the war comes into being. So with the war, we're not going to talk strategy. We're not going to talk about anything super big or whatever. Oh, it's, or I shouldn't say super big. Super detailed. It's all going to be big arrow type of stuff. When it comes to the Korean War, the attacks were massively devastating. When Kim and his soldiers invaded across the 38th parallel, the South Korean army was ill-prepared, the American advisors in Korea were ill-prepared, and remember, because the United States occupying force in Japan was by, by design relatively poorly armed, you don't need massive weapons against a uh, former enemy nation that wants to cooperate and does cooperate with you. The Americans did not have big, huge tanks, big, huge artillery, a lot of aircraft, uh, et cetera. And so in the early days, when the American army went to help uh, the Republican or the Republic of Korea's troops, we got shellacked. Right alongside the South Koreans, we got whooped. And what happens is Truman goes to the United Nations and says, we need to get a, uh, some type of action here because the United Nations helps us in securing our uh, world by collective security. Well, okay, fine. The Security Council then gets together and says, here's what we'd like to do. Uh, we, the Security Council, call for other United Nation members to support South Korea in this uh, unjust action. Great. Uh, the, South, uh, the Security Council gave to the United States and to Truman the ability to lead the forces, organize the forces. Truman appoints MacArthur, et cetera, et cetera. And there it is. But what about the Soviets? Why, you know, because you might remember that in the Security Council, five per permanent members, United States, Great Britain, France, Soviet Union, and China, well, because of the issue of Mao versus Chang, and which is the official China, the Soviets were boycotting the Security Council meeting. So they weren't there to exercise their veto power. Guess what? The Soviets, the Russians, have never missed a Security Council <laughs> meeting since. <laughs> Not one. And because of this, the United States gets pushed through the call for other United Nation members to join the United States, to join with the South Koreans, to repel the, the, South, the North Korean invasion. And this comes to uh, the first war aim in the Korean War, to reestablish the 38th parallel, to secure, to restore South Korea. Great. And it seemed to be pretty 
going pretty well, at least on the political side, at least on the organizational side. But on the military side, oh. So this is where the American Air Force rounds up the aircraft and sends them to the Far East. This is where the Navy sends the aircraft carriers and steams across the Pacific, pell-mell. This is where the United States is trying to hang on, along with the South Korean allies, to stave off defeat. The North Koreans had pressed so hard to push the, North, uh, the South Koreans and the Americans down into this area known as the Pusan perimeter, the port city of Pusan right here. And with that, hanging on, hanging on, what to do? The war seemingly was over by Labor Day. But unfortunately, the North Koreans did not count on the brilliance, the audacity, the sheer stupendous intellectual and also monumental ego <laughs> of a General uh, Douglas MacArthur. And he creates a plan where the uh, American and South Korean forces would push out of the Pusan perimeter, and here's where the Americans would do this end around and land at Incheon, which is only so far away from Seoul, and between the moving hammer and the anvil smashed the North Koreans, which was absolutely brilliant because it led to the war's second political aim. Now, let us try to unite all of Korea <coughs> under democracy. <laughs> now, mind you, the communists had their own program of uniting all the Korea under communism, so why should we be surprised that the West and the South Koreans and the Americans would be pushing for all of, South or all of the Korea to be under uh, democracy? Well, we happen to see how the uh, Americans and the South Koreans are pushing ever so closer to this border between North Korea and China, and a little bit further to the north and east, North Korea and the Soviet Union. So we're dancing with two, so, uh, two communist heavyweights in the Korean War. It's not just teeny tiny little Korea, but North Korea borders China, borders then the Soviet Union, now Russia. And that makes people think, and it should. We happen to see that the communists start to come into the war. You see, when the Americans, and particularly the Americans, had pushed across the 38th parallel right here, China had sent a message through India and India relayed the message to the United States in a rather secure <coughs> way that basically said, if American forces cross the 38th parallel, you can expect uh, communist forces from China to flood, flood, mind you, across the Yalu River, and we will rescue our fraternal brothers. Do not regret your decision. The Americans heard that and went, <laughs> piffle, who cares? Yeah. What can they really do? And a reminder, you know, the Department of State, the Department of War, the CIA, everybody, including Douglas MacArthur, nobody heard anything that the communist Chinese were coming. <laughs> Except we were starting to capture Chinese troops <laughs> and Chinese troops in Chinese uniforms and Chinese troops in Chinese uniforms with Chinese weapons. And there seemed to be a preponderance of evidence that suggested strongly that the Chinese were coming and already here. And the Americans basically said, uh, no. It doesn't fit our worldview. It doesn't fit what we want to accomplish. Uniting all of Korea under democracy. Except <laughs> when the Chinese poured in by the hundreds of thousands. And they poured in. And it was a massive onslaught. And it wasn't just a little bit. They pressed all the way down and pushed the Americans and South Korean forces further south of the 38th parallel, which kind of leads to our third war objective, restoring South Korea all by itself. It's a repeat of the first war objective, but it's this third one in a line, and <sighs> you get the point. 
Well, while all this, of course, is taking place, uh, President Truman had a confrontation with General of the Army's Douglas MacArthur. You see, MacArthur was focused on, on Asia, and in specific, the idea of China and Korea. And MacArthur did not believe that the American effort against the Soviets in Europe was as important as establishing who would control the world for the next 10,000 years because the power would emanate from Asia, in particularly China. And so what Eisen, or what, sorry, what MacArthur was proposing was that the United States should unleash the tiger that was Chiang Kai-shek with about half a million uh, nationalist Chinese troops to go fight in Korea against <laughs> other, uh, other Chinese forces, the communists. The United States should drop nuclear weapons in China on various cities to not just tell them back off, but to destroy weapons production and transportation depots and communication centers, et cetera. He also suggested that the United States should, should sow a belt of radioactive cobalt on the Chinese side of the Yalu River, about five miles wide, so that when the Chinese cross to invade to help their fraternal brothers, that they would become irradiated, much like cockroaches upon contacting a decon strip or raid repellent would die. And then he said, there is no substitute for victory, except uh, military victory is not the only victory that you will ever find in war. Military victory is not the only victory that's on the menu. You may not realize, but the United States government and military today is in negotiations with the Taliban in Afghanistan to get out of that nation. Not all wars are won by military conquest. And besides, Truman had told MacArthur to be quiet. <laughs> and MacArthur was not. Truman told him to be quiet a second time. And this time, kind of like with a little puppy dog on the nose, stop it. And so when letters leaked out bearing the dates after Truman had told MacArthur to shut up, that's when the United States political authority asserted itself over the military authority as the Constitution says and got MacArthur out. As what one high-ranking American official said, that trying to fight the communist Chinese was the wrong war against the wrong enemy in the wrong place at the wrong time. But with all that taking place, of course, desperate counterattacks between China and uh, the South Koreans and North Koreans and United States uh, troops all over the board. In fact, the battle lines ultimately resemble World War I, trench warfare, than they do a fluid battlefield like you find in World War II Europe or across the Pacific Ocean. But we ultimately, of course, get to the, the negotiations. We start in mid-1951, but they go until mid-1953. Why? Because the communists were a little bit grouchy about the shape of the table is not the right way. Uh, we need, uh, how many people are you going to have? Well, we want one more person than that. How tall are you people going to be? We, we, we give us lifts to put in on our shoes so we can be taller. You know, it, it's nonsensical things like that, but anyhow. The big issues were trying to figure out where the uh, ceasefire line was, because obviously the more territory you have, the better your demands could be with, um, with post-war negotiations, and also what to do with prisoners of war. You see, according to international treaties regarding the treatment and return of prisoners of war, they are to go back to their country of origin. The United States had seen a horrible situation with German POWs had, that had been captured by the Soviets in World War II. 20% of the German prisoners in World War II uh, held by the Soviets went back, if you will, untouched, basically healthy. 
60% of all German POWs held by the Soviets in World War II returned to their country through under, after undergoing some form of abuse, be it physical or malnutrition or whatever. 20% of all prisoners of war held by the Soviets were executed, uh, uh, just outright, killed on the battlefield, killed uh, off the battlefield, killed transporting from point A to point B. No, just kill them. That was not a pleasant taste in the mouths of the Americans who had a very solid taste for justice because it was the United States that crafted, that designed, that wanted the international military tribunals held in Nuremberg to try the former German political and military hierarchy. The United States pressed for the Tokyo war crimes trials to put on, on the, in the dock the Japanese political and military masters that had led, in both cases, to millions upon millions upon tens of millions of deaths. We had a sense of justice. justice. And so if so we're thinking we're about thinking prisoners, prisoners of war, of war do we just do we turn just them turn back, back, fearful, fearful that the communists are just going to, going to what are you, what are you, what's, what's going to happen? Gonna happen? Do, you do you realize that the Germans, the Germans certainly, certainly during World War II, killed their, their millions, millions of Soviet prisoners, Soviet prisoners right out of hand. Out of hand. Easily. Easily. About, About the five and a half million, million prisoners, prisoners uh, Soviet prisoners Soviet captured by the Germans, the Germans. Easily. Easily. Three million. Three million. Three million. Executed. Ex straight out of hand. Was not, was not even a question. Even a question. Of, of the, the millions, millions that returned to the Soviet Union, Stalin arrested the vast majority and sent them to the gulags or had them executed. Why? Because he was fearful that they had been tainted by some form of fascism. So if the United States remembers what the Soviets did to their German prisoners of war and what the Germans did to the Soviet prisoners of war and the Soviet prisoners of war in return to the communist nation of their birth, what moral, what moral issue do we have of returning people to be slaughtered by our estimates and by estimates those of the protecting powers like Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, etc., and other communist nations as well, like Czechoslovakia, Poland, who had been with their about 40%, about 40% of all communist Chinese prisoners did not want to return home. So what do we do with that? Ultimately, we come to the position that we have no other choice and we send back, we repatriate all prisoners of war back to their home. Hopefully, the North Koreans and the Chinese would do the same for South Korean soldiers and American soldiers as well. But the United States, in a way of trying to keep up the pressure on the, on the North Koreans and the Chinese, we use our massive air power in Operation Strangle that lasts two years. Oh, the same amount of time and the same bookend dates as our peace negotiations, go figure that, which is going to be a parallel, if you will, at the end of the Vietnam War, too. We go after their industrial centers, we go after their irrigation dams that hold back the water so that they can raise rice. Oh, yeah. The United States made war on food. It's amazing what happens when starving people are running out of options, including life that will bring them to the, to the negotiation table. As it takes place, why do we get the end of the war? Well, Stalin dies in 1953, that's pretty good. Well, we have Operation Strangle as well. And then President Eisenhower at this time basically says, hey, China, hey, Soviet Union, hey, North Korea, yeah. you know what? Combat troops are expensive. Building airplanes and tanks and navies, that is, that's expensive. You know what's not expensive? Nuclear weapons. We get uh, literally more bang for the buck. And it's not so much bang for the buck, but for the buck. So tell you what. Truman was one guy. I'm my own man. Mess with the bull. You're going to get the horns. <laughs> they kind of bought onto that line. 
and said, get it. Get it. All right. All right. So then, so then, after all after that, all that after, after the war, war after, after the, the nearly, nearly 1,300,000 to 1,400,000 North, North Koreans, Koreans who are now dead, dead. after the hundreds of thousands of people, of people uh, from, from the People's Republic, Republic of China, China that are dead, dead. after the, the 300,000 plus, plus South Koreans, Koreans if not if more, who are dead, and that's just that's the military, just, that's not the civilians. After, After the 40 some odd thousand, thousand Americans, Americans who are dead, dead. so what? Now what are we going to do? Well, here we go. Here we go. What's the international takeaway, shall we say? Well, first of all, Cold War is going to continue both hot and cold. Okay, the United States, Soviet Union are going to use other nations as their proxy nations to fight one another because remember, in the Cold War, you cannot keep track of just winners and losers according to how many people live and die and how much land you take. You have this big airborne. Where you can score a win or you score a loss. Communists take over China, that's a loss. The United States and Western Europe succeed in keeping Berlin alive, that's a win. Korea, as a peace but no clear out military victory, okay, fine. We'll call that a tie. It's all in the air. But what about the international side? How do you handle the humanitarian catastrophe in North Korea that existed from then all the way to the present? There's, there's no way that we can understand it. There's no way that we can understand, absorb that capacity. Uh, try as we might. And I have a hyperactive imagination to be sure. But there's no way that I can understand the, the, the deepness of starvation, the hopelessness within that society. And, and maybe you might say, well, okay, that's the only thing that the North Koreans know. I would venture to say not. Because even though communications is stifled at the border of outside coming into North Korea, you can't, you can't keep out, keep out ideas, ideas that even that will even germinate, germinate among the indigenous people, people without any type of outside, outside interference or influence. What about, what if you will, will, let's say the United States of America? America? A couple of takeaways from that. Well, we know that ever since, ever since, North, ever since, since the Korean War, war we, we don't need to use, use declarations, declarations of war, war to, to put troops into the field. You may not remember, but according to the Constitution, the President of the United States does not declare war. Congress declares war. 50% plus one vote in both the House and in the Senate. It is easier to go to war than it is to put a Supreme Court justice on bench. <laughs> easier to go to war than to pass tax reform. It's easier to go to war than it is to amend the Constitution. And Congress does not need a president saying, hey, I need a declaration of war. Congress could do it all on its own. Be kind of weird, but still, anyhow. Uh, we somehow demonstrated that we could use a limited war to fight back communism. We could use a limited war to fight back the Soviets. We don't need to use atomic weapons. We don't need to use big blasters. We don't need to use thermonuclear weapons that will blow apart all of Moscow. And I mean, all of Moscow. Because if we did that, guess what? All of New York City is going to be gone. We kind of resist that temptation to press the hard button because we understand what that means. The difference between total war and limited war. Limited war gives you a little bit more of an option a little bit more, a few, a few more tools in your belt to solve the issue. We get to the point of, what about the future? What about future wars? And we can go into that, but certainly uh, that's for another occasion, particularly when you slip from fighting an organized army with an organized nation to now fighting terrorists who are not part of a nation's government. Anyhow, that's something different. <laughs> Korea kept Korea, the, United the United States from States recognizing, recognizing the People's Republic of China as the real China, China the China with the power, China the China with the, China the, China the, the potential. potential. The United States is always focusing, focusing 
on Taiwan until we get to the Carter administration where we change this policy. <laughs> but for the longest of time, we're going to deal with Taiwan. And even now, even now, there are delicacies, diplomatic delicacies to be observed between how the United States deals with Taiwan versus the People's Republic of China. And certainly, we have a nuclear arms race that came out of this with the Soviet Union. Okay, that's the international side, that's the American side. What about North Korea? Very easy, very quick. Uh, first of all, their economy and agriculture is so wiped out that they can't feed themselves. They cannot take care of themselves. They are dependent upon goods smuggled in or even purchased uh, from China, from Russia, even now. That's basically how they stay alive in a subsistence, sub subsistence society. Not only that, but they are always probing the United States and South Korea. You may not realize. But ever since the armistice signed in 1953, that Americans and South Korean soldiers have died along the border. You may not know, but the United States Army gives out a, a, an award for combat called the Combat Infantryman's Badge. After World War II, the only way that you could get it was in direct combat with the enemy or if you served in a unit along the demilitarized zone in Korea, because men died in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, it is an ongoing problem. Maybe not so many Americans dying recently, but it's still a most dangerous place. Also, the North Koreans are looking to establish themselves as a great nation power. And the one way that you can do that, and about really the only way that they observe as having a substantial play is through the development of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons delivery system. And in particular, nuclear weapons delivered by missiles. Short range, medium range, long range. And so, and so when the when North Koreans North test a missile that goes up into the sky about 2,000 miles and it comes back down and splashes into the ocean, and you kind of go, well, it didn't really go that far. Remember that you can fire a missile 2,000 miles in this direction with the curvature of the Earth, you have long reach. Finally, uh, we have the establishment of a dynasty and a long-time dynasty uh, that rivals uh, uh, some dynasties in Africa, South America, Central America, uh, even in Europe. There has been a stability in North Korea that the Italian government might be envious of. <laughs> but they've also been a brutal regime, repressive regime, murderous regime. And the big question is, how do you deal with murderers? You might think, well, we ended the war with Germany and Japan. Yeah, but we did not deal with Hitler. We did not deal with Mussolini. That, remember, was unconditional surrender. And those guys were killed because of because circumstances, circumstances not from the direct hand of the United States or other allies. But perhaps the last statement that I can make with Korea, or particularly North Korea, is not out of my words, but with your own eyes. A satellite imagery of the North and South Korean Peninsula where South Korea is lit up like a Christmas tree with lights from cities and roads and towns and hamlets all over, experiencing an economic life that the North Koreans up to this point have never and can never fathom. This is the commentary that I wish to leave you that is far more eloquent and far more powerful than I think that I could ever describe. 
because it's the people who are living in the blacked out regions still have a, hopefully a fire in their heart for freedom. Thank you very much. Now, accordingly, this is the moment when you all can run pell-mell for cookies and, and other uh, refreshments and stuff. I'm going to stick around here for a little bit and answer questions. And in, in about 15 minutes, if you all want to, if some of you wish to go, that's fine. But if somebody wants to come around and come back in here and talk about the issues, be happy to. Thanks. We'll see you in a bit.